Welcome to this program of the Ruth Suko Memorial Association, a program on Ruth's first novel called Country People. I'm Barbara Lounsbury, president of the Suko Association, and thank you so much for coming. Before we begin the program, I want to express the association's thanks to the Hearst Center for the Arts and to Sherry Huber Odding for hosting this event today. And also a special shout out of thanks to Dr. Roy Behrens, who is here in the audience today. Many of you know Dr. Behrens as a writer, artist, brilliant graphic designer. And with his great generosity, Roy has designed the, the banner and the six panels that you are seeing around you on the stage. And they are going to be part of the Rusuko traveling exhibit that will begin traveling around the state starting January 1st of 2024 to launch the centennial celebration of that first novel of Rusuko country people, which is set in Northeast Iowa. Um, I also want to say just a few uh, words before we start about a, a student scholarship and teacher award that we are giving in connection with uh, country people. Uh, this $1,000 Iowa student award is available for all Iowa high school AP students or community college or college and university students. All they have to do is write an essay on country people or on five of one or more of five Suko short stories, which we have listed on the website, ruthsuko.org. Deadline is January 1st, 2024. So urge your favorite student or urge your favorite teacher uh, to get to encourage their students to write essays on country people or on a Suko short story or more and win a $1,000 uh, student scholarship. Well, to prepare us for next year's launch of the centennial celeb celebration of the publication of Country People, uh, we thought we'd prepare ourselves by having a panel of experts talking about the novel and their responses to it. So they were going to just come up in order and give their brief 10-minute uh, responses to the novel. So let me introduce them all to you at once. First, you will see Dr. Jim O'Loughlin, who is a professor of English and head of the Department of English at the University of Northern Iowa. He will be followed by Dr. Julie Husband, professor of English at the University of Northern Iowa. Then Iowa historian Bill Douglas, and followed up then by Sherry Dargan, Emerita Professor of English at Hawkeye Community College. So sit back and prepare to listen to four reactions to country people, and then be sure to give your own reactions in the, the Q&A that follows. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of things from the centenary edition of Country People that will be coming out for 2024, at the end of which, or middle in the middle of which, I will be able to reveal the cover of it, which is why you have this, we have this up here. Um, but I want to talk, and in, in doing this, we're going to just talk about two things we, that are mentioned in the introduction that uh, Julie and I have been drafting. Um, 
I first I just want to talk a little bit about H.L. Mencken, who was a name that had come up, some people are pretty familiar with, who in researching this introduction really was struck by um, the importance uh, that he played at a kind of pivotal moment in her writing career. Now, it seems that um, to go first, came to the attention of Mencken, John T. Frederick, the publisher of the Midland, um, who I think, I think kind of like either encouraged to go to, to um, send something to him or send some of her work to him. Uh, now, Mencken himself was kind of an iconic classic, kind of mercurial figure, but who had a lot to do as a as an editor and publisher with establishing some of the like literary reputations from some really important writers in the uh, in the early and middle of the 20th century century. And he had a mission to broaden American literature regionally, ethnically, and aesthetically. Um, he was a prolific reader who would read like, at least a novel a day. So he like knew a lot of what was what was going on, and he really took great pleasure in tweaking the noses of traditional literary elites. So he conceived of Stucco as the Midwestern writer of the German American world experience. Now that is, and that mattered to him in a particular way. So in fact, one quote he wrote, in one letter he wrote to her about something she was writing. The subject interests me because of my notion that the Anglo-Saxon stock in America is played out. And that most of the current artistic activity is among the peoples of later immigration. That kind of weird 1920s language. Yeah. Um, in the same language, he discouraged her, or the same letter, he discouraged her from moving to New York, characterizing, characterizing writers there as frauds, in contrast to what he saw as Duco, which is a writer with fresh observations of an experience of the settlement in the growth of Midwestern towns that did not play a large role in fiction. At that time. And I'm just going to kind of briefly talk about some of this, just so you know here. And he, um, many of her early short stories were accepted by Megan, who would like initially accepted three of her stories, deemed them all masterpieces for his uh, magazine, Smart Set, and would have a super story in the magazine almost any time he could get one. So for, for several years, very productive partnership, he championed her work. One year, he accepted nine stories from her in a single year. And even would publish some of her larger kind of novelette size stories that otherwise would have been hard to find a publisher for. And he, and he um, is the one who uh, gets her then her first pub the publishing deal for uh, country people. Um, she was talking about trying to publish a collection of short stories, and she was like, Well, you really, he was like, No, you really need a novel first, um, but don't rush it, it'll come, don't worry about it. And either he was you know, pressured in this, or he just proved himself. You know, proved his own point because he saw in country people the makings of Sucro's first book. It's not clear whether it was actually ever designed to be her first novel, whether it was just a really long short story. Uh, but in either case, when Sucro sent the manuscript to Macon in 1921, he forwarded it to the underwriter of the Smart Set magazine, who was Alfred A. Knopf, you know, the name of the publishing company, but it was the actual person. Um, and then Knopf agreed to publish the book. And then it ran in a serialized format for consecutive issues in another Mickey magazine called The Century. Um, now, Suko and Mickey would later have a falling out in the 1930s when she pursued a different book publisher. And Mickey was actually pretty merciless about it, if you ever want to read this. Um, but at this pivotal time in her writing career, Mankin played a really absolutely crucial role. I think it's important to keep just to know that people that are interested in this book. All right, so now we get up to the, the cover, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why we have it here. So this will be the cover for country people when it is uh, when it is released. Oh, someone should tell me to release. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've done this on the Okay. All right, please reveal. Yes, you've already realized. So. Um, this is a grand wood painting that we've been able to get a, we're able to get for the for the cover. Um, fortunately, it's actually owned by the Cedar Rapids Community School down there for everybody that wants to talk. You can actually see this in Cedar Rapids. So it's um, young corn is it, uh, the, the name of this. And and though Suko and Wood um, became acquainted in the 1920s, many critics have spoken about their similarities. We're pretty sure this is the first time. 
Um, his art has well ever been used to illustrate one of her books. Um, and I just want to talk a little, very little bit about why this particular um, painting, aside from the fact that it was not that expensive to license. <laughs> Uh, the rural landscape, as you can see, if you can see, you, I'll leave this up if you can be close to it, is really at the foreground of Joan Um, It is foregrounded in that lower third of the painting, is the newly painted field of the title, staked in the geometric precision of planted cornrows. And then as the landscape stretches towards the horizon, trees, fallow stretches, and additional fence bounded acres can be seen. And then in the center of the painting, small enough that it can be overlooked, you probably can't tell from the back row, there's a half grain farmer on his knees, bent over a bucket in a newly planted field with a, another farmer and child near him. And then off to the right hand side, there's a small, neatly kept yellow house. But the effect of this is to con of this contrast is placed place great emphasis on the planted fields, showing in the aftermath of the labor needed to transform them for agriculture. And as in Grant Wood's most famous painting, American Gothic, the setting is essential for understanding the human figures. In American Gothic, the farmhouse's disproportionate Gothic window, based on an actual house still standing in Elgin, Iowa. It offers an ironic and to some celebratory commentary on the ambitions of the father and daughter in the foreground. But in Young Corn, the farm itself dominates the frame. Human figures toil quietly and likely incessantly in the background. And similarly, in Cookie Peeper, people, and I'm not going to get the family name right, but I'll try that. I believe it's the Cater Henry, is that right? Or the Cater? Not Cater, thank you. The Cater Henry's farm and the incessant labor required to work the land is at the heart of the novel. August is driven both by necessity and desire to make a success of the farm. His wife Emma and their children are bound up in that pro project. Only towards the end of the book, when August and Emma leave the farm, does the narrative consider the interiority of the characters who quite literally haven't had a moment to stop and think. Now, country people is part of a Midwestern tradition that pushes back against an up and out model of excessive individualism, where characters leave their homes to cast their fortunes in a distant city. In its investment in communal experience, experience that joins together families and generations, country people, part of a tradition that stretches back to Hamlin Garland's main travel roads and forward to work such as Louis Erdrich's Love Medicine, David Rose Driftless. In, in Sugo's world, people are not just in the country, the country is in the people. And I will stop there. <laughs> Oh, I just did want to make a shameless plug. I've got some uh, books over here. Uh, if you're interested in checking them out, including the one I showed last week, the Bernard Newman's book about his sister. Right. You can see why I was very excited about the book. It's just been painted from the yellow. We didn't even talk about that, Sherry. All right. I wanted to talk just a little bit and very briefly about the. Um, the critical reception of country people. And I broke it down to three phases and I'm kind of adding my own into the third phase. Um, and I'll just quote a little bit from some of the, the critics. I would say, you know, when um, Country People first was published in 1924, um, it was received primarily in the tradition of regionalism as a very faithful representation of uh, Midwestern country life. And, and praised as such. Um, but some praise was laced with criticism, which I, I do think eventually, um, you know, Sukho uh, herself addresses. So, Great Summers in 1926 praises Sukho's photographic attention to detail and artistic phrasing, but she's critical of what she describes as a lack of form or software characters. Quote, country people, more than any other work, taste of the soil. It's a clean taste, but a dull, heavy taste that leaves one oppressed with all the burdens of the three generations of the Cater Henry family. The Cater Henrys were steady plotters, but they spent all their energy on the soil. They so fused themselves into it that they buried their own personalities. Pretty heavy criticism. Um, and other people pick up on this and address it. So Lane McCurry, that was in 1926, response. 
Um, Blaine McCurry was writing maybe 1928, something like that. And he says that Suko renders the commonplace so deftly, so minutely, as to make one relive it. And the more I reflected on my reading experience of country people and of uh, the, these early critics, the more I realized that that's actually where I found the value too, that I was kind of on this journey. And I too felt like, oh man, when does it get better? Like, is he really going to court, is the audience really going to court Emma by saying she is so strong? Like, is that is that her best he can do? Uh, so, but it, it helped you to relive it. So then Robert Frost, 1931, actually wrote a letter. Um, to uh, to Suko, this was in the Iowa Art Colony. He expected her work, quote, to be against something: a small town, marriage, Rotarianism, Puritanism, nationalism, Americanism, destiny, a whole list. And it isn't. It proves to be without guile or thesis. It is just stories of life vividly restored. Each one satisfied if it is true to its inward self. That is the way I like stories, and should want mine to be. So that's 1931. Suko herself was ambivalent about being read as a regional writer. Um, she conceded to some of the criticism of country people. This was her first novel, it was her apprenticeship work. Um, she, and then she writes in the third person, which seems like such a simple move um, to be like a little like, I'm not really invested in this, I'm, I'm keeping myself a little bit in reserve. Uh, so she writes about herself saying, she was sometimes inclined, being a good Middle Westerner, to trust perhaps overconfidently that material would speak for itself. There is no writer or artist concealed among its characters uh, who is destined to come back later to write a book about or paint a picture of the farm of August Cater Henry. August himself never offered the soliloquy upon capital T, capital S, the soil. He never seduces a hired girl and he dies in bed, not overlooking his broad acres nor clutching a handful of his own good earth. Uh, a little bit of a dig at Pearl Buck and at Willie Cather. <laughs> uh, the style does fit the subject matter in its careful country minutia, its touch of dry country humor, even its hardness and tightness. That's true. I think that she understood both the strengths and weaknesses of the style she had chosen. By 1960, Suko's work had fallen out of print. Um, and then 1960 is the year that she dies. Um, and then there's a recovery of Suko, starting with Lita Cassane's 1969 biography, and then Margaret Stewart Omicran's 1972 critical study. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start seeing more articles coming out after 1972. Both of them refer to the book as a family chronicle. I think that's very accurate. I think that makes this one of the difficulties I think sometimes readers have is that it initially it doesn't seem there's a main character unless maybe it's August. Later critics come to see Emma as the most interesting central character. And of course, the last section of the novel is dedicated to Emma. And that's kind of where I come down on the novel as well, that, that it's important that Emma not be foregrounded initially because it puts us in the position of Emma in her culture where she's chosen August choose with her as his wife because she's strong and she loses her giggles. Unlike, and just a little subplot, but her sister remains kind of giggly. Her husband is way less successful, but her sister Molly appears to be having kind of a happier, easier life than um, poor Emma, whose house never gets renovated until August is getting ready. But <laughs> um, so if we read the story as a story about competing value systems, as does Oma Grandin, Margaret Lane in 1972, then it starts to take on kind of a more sociological value uh, as opposed to, you know, faithful attention to detail. And that's where I think this middle phase of criticism finds the value in country people as a kind of sociological criticism, um, but not yet feminist criticism. This, this middle section is really interested in competing value systems between the um, settler generation, August generation, who found these farms, and the younger generation, their children, who take a variety of different paths and offer some critique of the kind of ceaseless round of toil that's represented in this picture and in the novel. So Emma's emergence at the end as a self-conscious character forging a new life for herself emerges through this critical lens as a central concern. Um, Fritz Olschlager, 
in his 1980 essay on Start Life, so not the same text, but I think it, it, it offering a similar perspective, argues that prior critics had, quote, underplayed her interest in sociological and economic issues. And so um, that's where a lot of the new critics, I think, come in. So the last phase of criticism that's interesting to me is the feminist reading of country people and a lot of her work. And so I'm just going to read a couple of quotes from a couple of different essays. Um, Caroline Gephardt's 1992 essay, in Iowa Woman, so it's kind of an important venue, um, says that the sociological turn takes a distinctively feminist turn in uh, Suko. She positions Suko among, quote, a bright constellation of regional writers who shaped a new course in American literature during the 20s. Sherwood Anderson, Willard Gather, Sinclair Lewis, and Edgar B. Masters. But where these other writers of small town America focus on the beauty of Midwestern nature, the warmth or claustrophobia of small town life, or the challenges of pioneer life, Suko honed in on women's lives, especially on portraits of women who so often feel hemmed in uh, by the conditions of their lives. She excels in evoking an era when feminism for most women, unthinkable as a political movement, was experienced nonetheless by ordinary middle-class American women as a nameless discontent. And I think that's important that Emma isn't even conscious of a way in which she has been um, you know, suppressed, uh, putting her own individual values and interests aside for the good of the family. Gebhardt effectively connects Suko's descriptive aesthetic, stripped as it is, of direct political commentary to the problem that has no name as pioneering second wave feminist Betty Friedan called women's discontent. But where Friedan begins to sketch and name this discontent in the American suburbs of 1963, Suko was portraying it 40 years earlier in rural Iowa. Um, skip a little bit to the end and to the punch here. Uh, a couple of different essays, late 90s. Uh, see Suko as a trailblazer on farm wives and spinsters, okay, uh, comparing her to Jane Smiley. Um, another critic comparing her to Gather and saying Gather is kind of glamorizing and um, somewhat uh, distorting the options available to women. I think uh, old pioneers and country people are very similarly constructed novels and worthy of more comparison, more analysis together. Um, and then the last critic, I just want to read a, a quote from this Bradford Collins. He writes in 2020, such an interesting um, piece. And if you haven't run across it and you've been searching Sukkot, that may be because he's actually writing on Brad Wood, a conversation about who is lady. But he wrote Brad Wood and Ruth Sukkot were friends. And in fact, Bernard Noon writes um, a letter for publication in an art venue for, uh, for Grant Wood. Um, Grant Wood was very afraid that he was his biography was being kind of confused with his work. He's like, I've got a serious art uh, magazines, don't want to talk about my work. They just want to talk about the Iowa hay scene. He was getting very worried about that. I think that tells a little bit about why he, some of his meaning is humorous or ironic. I think he's trying to find a space for himself. So Bradford Collins says that in such a restricted environment as we see in coming people, women, and he argues those with non-normative sexualities, would struggle to find satisfying love lives. And he investigates how Suko represents spinsters on route to consider, considering other repressed sexualities. Um, farm women, uh, Bradford Collins says, uh, have two options in life, to marry or be a spinster with all the social liabilities such a derived word to be suggested. Collins sees a direct line from the cramped lives of Sukkot farm women to Woods Wolves being speaking American Gothic. Um, and I could, at some later point in time, extend Collins to the representation of Emma's daughter Mary in the book. Mary, I think we see her suffer from conversion disorder as she starts to have this ambition, August has an ambition, her ambition is that she wants to be a teacher. Not to do it. She's not going to get sent to school to be a teacher. So maybe she'll be a, a so she'll be a really great seamstress, and nobody will hire her in small town 
Iowa. And eventually she does marry and she becomes this foreign woman and she has to find her way, but she gets very ill before that happens. So um, we could talk more about some of the alternatives in country people to the, the lives of uh, mothers and wives. And now for something completely different. I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, German Methodism in Iowa now. A background. Uh, on this, this week, I was in 130 years ago uh, at the uh, first World Parliament of Religion in Chicago. And this is Cape Kleinfelter Bowman of Des Moines. Ascendant of the, the platform, or one of the platforms, and addressed the Evangelical Association of Congress on both the heroines of the Evangelical Association. The, lo the lovely image of Mrs. Bowman holding forth on the Evangelical Association's illustrious past is somewhat undercut by the fact that another eruption of the crisis in the denomination had begun. With the church trials in Iowa, the church trials in Iowa, 1889, a civil court battle over which national conference was legitimate was filed in Polk County Court that year, and uh, it was wending its way through to the Iowa Supreme Court as Bowman was speaking. State courts always hated to deal with ecclesiastical disputes. And they remanded it back to the denomination, which split. So the Evangelical Association is one of three major German Methodist uh, groups, uh, and it's it's the the one the one that's uh, most well known in association with Cedar Falls because uh, in nineteen uh, around nineteen ten. Uh, the denominations of retirement community uh, or home is, is formed. It's called Western Home. So that you may recognize. Uh, and but also the, the, the church the denomination that was future husband, Herbert Newton, who walked in. You say a few words about the second strand, which is uh, the United Brother in Christ. And the uh, the person who's most well known in Iowa is a person called Milton Wright, Bishop Wright uh, of Cedar Rapids. And once again, he's known within the, the church for a split, the issue being whether uh, church members ought to be, could also be members of secret societies. I think he was against it. But he's uh, uh, much better known for his famous sons. Uh, Wilbur, Wilbur and, and Orville. They got their fame somewhere else. And then the third major strain is uh, German Methodist within the larger Methodist Episcopal Church, in Northern Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, and I think that's the one uh, where the Sucos, uh, or William Sucos family grew up in. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure, but he, uh, it is known that they were converted uh, in, in the Midwest uh, by the, the famous, the legendary uh, Methodist revivalist Peter Cartwright. Uh, so that would indicate probably they were they were within the larger uh, Methodist denomination, but that they had their own congregations at that time. And then there's a, the 20th, the early 20th century is a, uh, a story of the opposite of the 19th century divisiveness. In 1946, the Evangelical Association, or Evangelical Church by the time, and the uh, United Brethren merged to form uh, the Evangelical United Brethren. And then in 1968, uh, the Evangelical United Brethren merged with the, the larger Methodist Church. For the United Methodist Church, and as far as I know, in all the death we ever had, or something that. Let's see. 
And I'm not going to go into a discussion of European pietism, but you can ask if you're really interested. Uh, but of course, William Sugo famously gives up on his, his German methodist background and becomes a congregationalist in this thing. He, he could he could have given he could have given up on the pietism without giving up on on German denominations, but he goes he goes the whole, the whole way and uh, becomes a member of, of you know one of the, the iconic American uh, institutions or religious institutions, and it's really indicative of the the second generation uh, wanting to be as American as possible, and of course Ruth being the, the third generation that tries to moderate somewhere between the, the first and the second. Um, and they just give you one more quote in conclusion, and then we can get back to country people. Um, about the same time as, as uh, Ruth was writing her book, a historian of the United Brethren summarized both the dilemma and the realities that, uh, of uh, being a, a mostly rural church in Iowa. After its Iowa membership peaked at 11,736 in 1970, he said, some said that decline was caused by departure from old ways, and others stated that it was caused by failure to adopt new methods that fast enough. As well, however, the correct question is, what is the will of God that will always prosper? But then he had Mrs. Benson says, the changes in the rural scene in Iowa were at heart the cause of it. And Michael, lights. Good afternoon. I'm so happy you came to join us. Okay, well, I can start talking about my romantic story without any slides. Several people here are a witness to the fact that Michael was, was uh, late to life to decide about romance. Uh, in fact, I will always love Scott. Do you know why Scott? Yes, <laughs> you had you bought him some expensive whiskey and you gave him a talking to. You gave him the number. And of course, for uh, uh, the story is told because I'm going to tell it. Uh, I brought me to on a hot date to uh, an early Ruth Suko Memorial Association. Annual meeting in Earlville, Iowa. <laughs> and no, we were not making out with that seat. I was handed a copy of Ruth Suko's book. I said her name wrong, and Mike said, Oh, say it that way, they'll like you. <laughs> but when I walked into that room, I was already in love. Uh, I loved Barbara from the first second I met her. Harvey has. Who cannot love Harvey? And we're going down the road a million miles an hour, and I'm reading this book, and Mike is giving me a hard time, but I kind of like him. So, as soon as I started reading those short stories, I recognized something. This was the Iowa of yesterday. This was the Iowa my mother grew up in, that my grandmother and great grandmother grew up in. And that made it even more special. And I loved the way she treated female characters. I really liked that. So here's a couple of pictures 
from the son of our church. Look at that gorgeous young woman, my goodness. And Sister Sarah, love her, miss her. She's gonna be watching this a little bit later on, so I can't tell you any stories about her. All right. Uh, the Christian Science Monitor. Boy, are we gonna be like kind of scary how we do this here? The Christian Science Monitor compared Grant Wood's 1936 painting, Spring Turning, was Sugo's first novel, Country People. The farmer with his team of horses, which accent the foreground of the painting, might have been her fictional Iowa farmer, August Cattingry, out early on a spring morning to plow his lush field. The writer and painter shared an eye for the minutia of everyday life, as well as a deep love for the beauty of the Iowa farmland. So, boy, we are really seeing some, some harmony here with uh, some of our ideas. So, what did I do? Oh, that was pointy. Uh, let me see, let's go on. We have talked about this already, but just to give my little twist on it, I have to tell you, reading this book, knowing the people in my family who were farmers, my mom was brought up on a farm, and then her wonderful, wonderful father died tragically when she was only 12, and they had to move into town and rent out the farm for money. And her grandma came back and helped. So I want to talk a little bit more about a little bit about what Julie said. That this, this book leaves you feeling this sadness about August. But also how many of you thought to yourself, even if he had lived five more years, he was bored. He didn't want to join the club. He didn't want to get more involved in the community. He wanted to go back out to that farm and do the things he'd been doing. He says he was probably 12 years old. But what about Emma? Emma. Emma wants it. She feels badly. She's got this beautiful, beautiful house. But did anybody else say to yourself, this woman is almost spookily my life in retirement? Grandchildren, book clubs, community organization, the church, immersing herself in the life of the community, finding ways to get that intellectual intellectual uh, life she had not had. And here is an epiphany. Who remembers her going to see her ancient father? He's like 90 years old. And she thinks, why was August taken? Here's my dad. Mm -hmm. And as she reads, she has an epiphany. What does she say? He's got something to think about. It was that something she could not name it, which she had missed all her married life. Well, I can tell you about marriage, and I can tell you about being a single mom. I was a single mom with left with a three and five year old when my minister husband walked out on us. And I was a college student going back to get my degree. I went to college for five years. I said sometimes I went to school with a vengeance because I was going to be a success. I was going to be a teacher. And that's what I did. But the fact of the matter is, during that time, when you're working that hard and you're taking care of children, what time do you have to yourself? 
What time do you have really for friends? What time do you have to reflect? That, that comes later, that comes later. All right. And she's talking about an intellectual life. And it's kind of an interesting thing. The book ends. How many people really like the end of the book? Has anybody read it? Did you find yourself saying, and, and that's it? After 200 and something to major? I mean, this kind of like lover of. Well, let's go get some ice cream. Maybe life will be better. I mean, she, she got beauty and joy out of garden. And I didn't understand that. I didn't know if that was younger. You drive by our place on Caraway Lane, and Michael just bought me two rose bushes. And today I have. A dozen roses, beautiful pink. In spite of all the heat, I saw those and just lifted my soul. Gave me a good feeling about today. Because if you've got a dozen pink roses to start the day, what else good is going to happen? Okay. So uh, she has this epiphany. She gets busy in the community. And then where does she get her not soulmate, but some companionship? Another widow. Mrs. Wall. So uh, I think the way it ends. It's very bittersweet. There is that almost philosophical thing that, I'm sorry, my mouth is really dry. <laughs> Jim, can you do me a favor? Hand me my pink bottle down here by my rollator. Thank you. All right. All right. So, they're sitting there talking. You know, do you remember when you were younger and you walked by the room where all the great aunts? Did anybody else have crazy women who crawled on a bed to talk? My mother and her two sisters would crawl on the bed. My grandma would welcome you to come sit on the bed and let's have a little visit. So they talk. And as they talk, they kind of come to this point of saying, well, at least we've got good houses. And we've got children to take care of us. We don't have to go to the poorhouse. Now, that may not be, let's go see Barbie. You know, and have some ice cream. But for them, there is some contentment with their place. Because they are at that point in their life where they have no one else to live for except themselves. And there is a wonderful, wonderful uh, passage, and I'm not going to read it, but uh, it says something about she blossoms. And she remembers she's really still a still. You know, the giggler, the girl who loved beauty, smile, had fun. All right. I also then want to dovetail it. I've got to read this because it just cracks me up. Uh, we were talking about reviews of country people, and the first novel of Rusuko has been described by her publisher as a simple and poignant chronicle of the dull and monotonous lives of a small community of farmers in Ohio. 
Well, that would be a page turner. <laughs> you would have people lining up at the bookstore. If my publisher ever said anything like that about my book, I'd be upset. Uh, but then he goes on to say, the wonder is that Ms. Suko has been able to invigorate so comprehensive a chronicle. This she has done powerfully. The novel's direct, beautiful in its simplicity, and alive even when monotonous. And certainly, the charming temperament lends itself to monotony. It's somber, deliberate, inarticulate, qualities which become impressive under Ms. Sugo's treatment. In her book, there's no way, no fun, but rather a grim humor that stirs pity. And that is written, that was written by Edward Augustus Lees from the Atlantic. Oh, that was fabulous. Now, believe it or not, I'm so crazy about Stuco, I put her in my novels. And I used something of Suko as I was doing my writing process. She would always say, just suppose. Okay, so I modernized it to what if. And I got the idea several years ago to use my mother's beautiful set of antique quilts. I have one that goes back to 1860. And that's the subject of book number two that's going to be out here within the next, I hope, two months. Uh, so what if a grandmother left her only grandmother a gift that unlocked, unlocked the secrets from World War II when three sisters went to California to build bombers and nurse injured sailors. And then they came back and the twins could not be in the same room without fireworks. So what happened to California? What if another grandmother found an old quilt while helping her sisters-in-law clean out Grandma Mary's house? And then a grand aunt, great aunt calls, to, calls her to tell her, burn it. Don't keep that quilt, burn it. What if she doesn't? She hides it away. And then 40 years later, she gets it out and asks Gracie and her boyfriend David to investigate. So what's the deal with this quilt? All right. What if Gracie, the granddaughter, and the main character of the series juggles three jobs. She teaches at the local community college, helps organize exhibits at the county museum, and writes articles for the Jubilee Times, her family's newspaper. What if Grandma Grace met Ruth Suko and bought all her books because Grandma Grace went to the Iowa School of, for Teachers? What was that? The Iowa State Teachers College, yes. And then Rusuko was up there. Uh, and Gracie knew up, know, grew up knowing about her and knew some of her short stories in her literature classes. So book one, we've got the rural community. Book two, I do something. And then book three, Barb's Excited. That's all I'm going to tell you. But uh, I had fun writing my books. I've had fun, including Suko. I wish that every young English teacher, every young history major knew we had a famous Iowa writer and didn't wait to be in their 40s to find out. So, okay, I am uh, supposed to now see if you folks have questions or comments? Any questions? Any comments? Oh, come on. You got some comments. We don't think Thank you. I just do not fall. I just want to take up on um, what Julie helped me understand last year is what she calls Ruth Sukos profound reality or um, 
our, our other uh, Dr. Sarah McAlpin has called her painful realism. And uh, to me, that's really been the entry in appreciating her book and particularly country people. Um, it's hard to recognize that life was so limited for German American, for our ancestors. And uh, I mean, I could probably point to my own family. Uh, um, inarticulate, not speaking. So just trying to make a success of it early on in life, you know, making that farm go was the key. And it all the things we value today, August didn't have time for, and he was uh, as limited as he was. And then today we say he was a terrible father, he was a terrible husband. Uh, why didn't he share? Why didn't his wife know anything he was doing? You know, didn't know he had a will. Um, and yet he was considered a good man. He was a good provider. I mean, what makes us look at what the standards were back then and what we expected of those people. And so it is the most profound realism. Uh, she doesn't criticize it. She doesn't give us a happy ending, but hope. I think as Julie says, there's hope for Emma and Emma and, and the next generation. And you can almost see Sukho's you know, what people call her most famous novel, The Folks, 1934, the bestseller, where she takes a family and really develops the children within it. So in this very first novel, she's just doing August and Emma and the kids are kind of there. But when she gets to the folks, she's got the father and mother, but then she works the kids out in detail too. So you can kind of see it grow, but um, other reactions, pro or con, or what bothered you or anybody? Yes, yes. Or do I have to have to <laughs> I can get it to you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, as a writer myself, who did not get published and watched me, uh, that really struck me. The first pages of any Pusuko novel, and especially this one, is she left a day in which she's so shocked. They crucify her. She opens with pages of that exquisite, minute, detailed description. And then she describes the character. She's going to get, as Julian was mentioned, in the third person on the kiss of death in the workshop. I was there, and the author was in Carol. You can't write like 19th century writers anymore. Nobody ever thought of Jane Austen again. People are still reading Bullock Hatter, too. Bullock Hatter. But what really struck me this time reading country was opening pages and your descriptions of all of these vocals. And I kept thinking of Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov, and how when I had read that out loud to my son in the car, I kept laughing out loud because I like, oh, this one is Dostoevsky Lenin's things. And what's the to this new He describes the spinning in the old man's teeth. And Suho was doing this with Mina, this pudgy, kind of homely, dusty girl. You know how these can be fair haired German women are stout and dusty. And another thing that really got me, after, besides the gossipy little small town shirt ladies and this, what is it that Suko missed her father? That's this anti Catholic sentiment that's so strong in every other. And I'm wincing and cringing as she has the nuns in their habits at the Mayo Clinic gliding with the robes in their rooms. And the street dog is down. The street dog is down. And they bit. Like, I'm not being her locals. And because. Oh, when I was in Germany, it was a town to my mate, he had to Germany. And, and like farm family, I mean, if you talk about August and his hard work and not living to enjoy it, it's like, oh, it didn't die with August. It didn't die with his children or their children. 
it's still alive and strong. Dr. Kowalski even wrote a little newspaper column about this back when I was in 1980, a freshman at UNI and taking this film class and mentioning that, yeah, I'm not supposed to be in college. My dad wanted me to stay home and farm or at least take a battery job. These are the anti-education as they come. I still have that column in my scrapbook somewhere. And thank you so much for that. And but anyway, the the gossipy people and the expectations that you grew up and you farm, you stay close to home, and all of the characters in this novel did, unlike uh, a lantern in her hand, best reader Aldrich, or all like kids go off and become bankers and dumb as wives, and everybody scatters, everybody flies. The, the old man at the end of this novel, you already covered it, he retires. And unlike the 90 year old father of Emma, what does he have to live for? And he soon declines and dies and goes back to the farm and has a stroke out there. And all of a sudden, it's way too close to home. It's all way too familiar. These people are all so real. And so, in fact, the fiction workshop and it's like, and this is the kind of stuff I was trying to write, and you can't write that. Where's the conflict? Where's the tension? And it's like, I'm looking at page one of country people. Where's the conflict? Where's the tension? I mean, what is it? We have to have exploding helicopters. <laughs> if he had a stroke in the field on page one, it would be like, wow, okay, this is a story worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that just haunts me about this one is the anti German sentiment in World War One. I've read different histories about this and the vandalism and the persecution. There was a, a high school or a grade school teacher that was fired from her job because she had a German last name. This doesn't, all children didn't really happen in office and wondering, I worked so hard, I worked with these people. He's not first generation German. I mean, he's like second. And all oh, his kids, they've been born and raised in this place. We've known me all your lives and suddenly we're at war with the Hun and I'm a Hun and you're calling me all of those anti-Germanic names. Like, don't you remember me? Don't you know me? And but he knew how to keep his mouth shut. Yes. That's so when people criticize, he didn't react and fight that. And his sons were in the war. I'm glad they all came home. Although one Johnny came back damaged. And I'm gonna just never shut up. So I just never cut this off. I just have one thing, and that is. How August lived and didn't talk and left everything inside, that is what many people do today. And I actually call that corporate syndrome because they lose their identity in what they do. And what happens is they don't know who they really are. That identifies them. And we have a lot of that today. People lose themselves in the work, in their family, in many things. So things really haven't changed. And so how will that change? And that's my question. I, I think I can say, I can talk loudly enough so I don't need a microphone. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking, why do we read it? Um, unless it's memorable, it has to be memorable. So a year from now, we will be talking about country people. We look back on country people and say, wow, sure glad I read that because I have so many insights into my current uh, situation in my life. And I know we all read idiosyncratically. Uh, I bring what I bring to a book and you bring all kinds of other things. So certainly everything we take away from it reflects what we are at the time. So when I read country people again, I think for the second time, I just didn't find it memorable. There was enough in there that connected to what I'm thinking about and wondering about, unlike, let's say, the awakening, Kate Chopin or Chopin, where a suicide at the end because she couldn't have her artistic uh, 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 ambitions realized. Uh, for any world for all kinds of reasons. And I just finished a book by Margaret Atwood called Old Babes in the Woods, a collection of short stories. Each one is so memorable. I'm still thinking about them. I finished it quite a lot of So, uh, I'm thinking about memorability, and to me, sorry, country people are just not very memorable. Not enough happens. She has a kind of realization at the end, Emma, where she's sort of waking up, but then it ends. <laughs> now, let's have another book with Emma blossoming and turning into Kate Chopin. Of course, that ends it's so tight, but that's not going to I mean, it would be interesting to see these characters once they've figured some stuff out. They're just, uh, Crystal is trying to figure stuff out, and by the time we become butterflies, 
one little thing, William Butterfly, it's over. So it's uh, sorry, I didn't find that number. <laughs> but do you have anybody in your uh, in your family who grew up on farms? No, no, no connection to farms. How many people here have somebody who grew up on a farm? Wow. I think of my step grandpa. I think of a couple of my uncles and that that work ethic. And remember, August was just a kid when he started. If he didn't work, he wasn't gonna eat. There were too many children. Yeah. So I think, you know, and I keep thinking this is strange. I think I'm the only English major in the room who ha also has a psychology undergrad. Um, but I think of Maslow's Pyramid. How many people have ever seen Maslow's Pyramid? And where is August living? Pretty, not in the basement, maybe on the first floor, maybe on the second floor. I did a stint as a social worker and found out it was not the job for me. I gave my lunch away to a homeless teenager on day one. I had a family come in. This was in Marshall. I had a family that had driven hours and hours from another state to apply for a job at the meatpacking plant where they would be on probation for three months. So if you got injured in the first three months, Sorry, you know, no insurance kind of thing. But I immediately watched this mother go to the bathroom, get a washcloth, wash all of her children. There were three or four kids in a station wagon, everything they, they owned or could bring in that station wagon. And part of me wanted to say, well, look, let's get you signed up at the community college. But no, they needed a place to stay, they needed diapers, they needed emergency food. I had to meet them where they were. August, hardworking man, had not had very many enlightened people in his life to give him any kind of a roadmap. You know, so I understand where you're coming from, but for me, I kind of thought. Oh, even my father, although my dad lived to be 93 or 94, in his 80s, he started making these little cute benches and these little toolboxes, and he sold them kind of like at garage sales and gave them money to the disabled veterans. That's just the I got you parts. He was never bored. I think Scott raises something that we need to work on in the Suco Association is how can we help yes. people find her memorable, find something that um, obviously he is connecting in some ways and other people, but uh, how can this, these very minute pictures of the way we were how can we make that uh, memorable and, and valuable? Well, and so it's, uh, that's such a good reminder. Uh, yes. I don't, I don't think I need the microphone. I'll no, if you don't use the microphone, it doesn't live stream. Oh, okay. I'm sure you said that earlier. Nicely, as I, as I can, I, what struck in reading the letters, the personal letters in the archive that Sue Paul Wright wrote, how much of her life was devoted to trying to carve out a space for herself, for trying not to get overwhelmed by family needs and such. And so, as we know, she's married until she's 37 um, and never has children. And, um, you know, she takes this adventurous walk from Etty Park, where she worked for the summer back to Denver where she was going to school and she really loses up. You can see that this is an adventurous person. It's not somebody who was inarticulate or who was afraid of experience, but she was afraid of getting overwhelmed by family responsibility. And knowing that, when I went back the second time to read country people, when I started country people, I was like, where is this novel going? What is this novel about? 
And, you know, it was the it, I it was like the right word for it. I see my events being that we were being told about that we didn't know why we were being told about it. But for me, the two most striking scenes when she goes to Mayo Clinic and um and everybody's paying attention to her concern about health, and she had her all button removed yeah. and miraculously she's all better. And I was just like, what? I'm like, I mean, he's yes, she's important to him. He realizes that when he's on the brink of losing her, but but it totally changes her perspective and his perspective as well. And the second scene is when she's in the garden and her favorite grandson's over. He's that adorable little three-year-old age, you know, the children are so handsome. And she gives him his little pot plant. He's not allowed into her garden. And I'm a gardener. My mother was a gardener, my grandfather was a gardener. No, no farmers in her family, but gardeners, yes. And I know like how like like nurtures and it's and she learned how to, to create these borders in which she can find creativity and satisfaction, and she feels like she deserves that. And to me, the second time through reading the novel, understanding the roots, that was what made it so much more important to me. Well, uh, we want to invite you to come back next year uh, in September. If you're still interested in country people, we're going to be celebrating the centennial of uh, the publication of, of country people with the new critical edition uh, of the of the novel um, by Jim Malone's uh, Thursday Press. Roy Barons, who did these wonderful panels, will be traveling the state. But next September, we invite you back to this very space. Look at the name Nurse Wonder if you know uh, I'm a poet laureate. Um, is going to give the keynote address of one on country people. So a full long address. And if you, uh, Mary Swander is a German American, an Iowa German American, like Bruce Ufo. She's a farm person, she's a writer. And, and so she, her thoughts on country people, I think, will be particularly interesting. And we're going to have a panel at about three called Country People on Country People. And we're going to uh, invite farmers, four farmers, two women, two men, one from each part of the state, um, four different decades, uh, who will read country people and give a, their 10 minute response to the novel. You know, what was right, what was wrong, what has changed. But, so I think it'll be very interesting to really see what actual Iowa farmers have to say about the novel. I, I'm just curious as to be, and then we hope we'll be getting our essay of $1,000 scholarship. So if you know somebody wants to write an essay by January 1, and then submit it on our website. So thank you so much.